on the bridge of the uh, Nebuchadnezzar. Um, and I am, I am uh, joined today. We're just going to give folks a few minutes to get started. And you're back. So this is the second time I use this software. And you can tell I'm doing the LinkedIn part because I have a nicer shirt. Um, my podcast co-host and I did a kind of an impromptu three-year celebration uh, for three years of our show. But uh, through the comments yesterday on my live feed, and again, you're probably noticing on LinkedIn, I'm trying to do more live feeds, um, that uh, we have with us today, um, Sarah du Dukevich. Mm -hmm. Okay, I got it right the first time. All you right. got it. <laughs> In the green room, I, I did test it. Uh, but she goes by Saduki. And um, uh, she's a longtime community person, 12-year MVP, I yes. think, as of today. As of today, Con correct. Congratulations. And uh, I used to be an MVP in the tablet PC space, so that was as a category Ooh. long gone. Uh, but now you, your background, I saw you last saw you on Twiat, which was this mm -hmm. week in Enterprise Tech. I don't yeah. know who hosts it now, but it used to be Padre um, SJ on Twitter. Mm -hmm. um, and, and Lumeresca. Uh, what is it? Lumeresca. Lumeresca. Was, okay, cool. His co-host, who's a longtime friend of mine, actually. Oh, awesome. Um, those guys at Twiat, they do, or and Twit, they do a lot of cool stuff. Um, I usually watch on the TV. And there's a point to the story because there's also another show called This Week in Windows. Mm -hmm. And Paul Therat gave me that sign, that oh, Lafine cool. Dumas sign. So it all comes full circle. So <laughs> uh, welcome back, Sa uh, Saduki. Um, and or Sarah, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> actually, funny story. So at tech conferences, if you see me in the hallways and yell Sarah, there's about a 90% chance that I won't answer you. But That's if you call right. me Saduki, I answer to that. That is funny because there's a lot of people that I only know their, I, I remember their Twitter handle. Mm -hmm. So it's like, and then people, mine is tablet tier from back from the tablet PC days, and I never changed it. Yep. So they call me table tier sometimes. Which is <laughs> I do remember the first time I saw your Twitter handle. I'm like, table tier? I'm like, no, 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 no. He talks about tablets. He's table tier. So I'm guilty. <laughs> the the coolest uh, Twitter handle uh, I've ever seen was uh, Maria Nagaga. She works at Microsoft. Lady I don't know Nagaga. what she does now, but um, it, was her, it was when Lady Gaga was really hot. You were talking about Lady Nagaga. Ah, his internet hiccup. Okay. All right. I think we're live again. Yes, Jeff, I think it is. I, I blame the Lady Gaga brand police. So let us never utter that Twitter handle name again. All right. So if you're just joining me for the second time, I'm here with Sarah Saduki, Sarah Dukevitz, uh, who is a longtime community leader in the development community. I met you a long time ago when I was an MVP. Mm-hmm. And we were talking about Twitter handles, but let's move off of Twitter. And yep. what was fascinating was the last I heard, you were kind of a .NET, C Sharp, 
and Rust developer. Uh, Not Rust. Uh, was it Rust or my? No, PowerShell. Powerful. I'm trying to cut saw, back. I'm sorry. Go ahead. And so, if you saw it on Twitter, that was PowerShell. That was PowerShell. Okay. So Not clearly, Rust. I need more caffeine. That, that's what <laughs> we've learned. Um, <clears throat> and um, so, but now I was excited that you're getting into data science. So I mm-hmm. think it's kind of cool. And you're also you're also kind of in a similar space when you want to help people get into data science. So your 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 background is in development. So let's talk mm-hmm. about what you used to do in the .NET world, and um, and then kind of what led you to data. So data has actually kind of been interwoven in my career. Mm-hmm. Um, my first internship was right out of high school before going to college, and it was doing QA of a database for um, basically it was car parts. I had the spreadsheet, and I had to make sure that the data was in the database properly. Um, but that led to me getting put on a project where I had an access database, and we were moving it to a SQL Server with a VB6 front end. And so wow. I... And I was playing with VB at home mm-hmm. and I was playing with VB talking to access. So I knew that part. I didn't know what the SQL server stuff was. <laughs> so right out of high school, I had an internship and I was like, okay, let's see what SQL server is. And then I saw it was data and I'm like, oh, it's organized data. I got this. This is easy. Right, uh, right. And it turned out to be a blast because I loved making interfaces that talked with data at the time. Mm-hmm. Um, I was, I fell under the wing of a contractor there and he's like, Hey, you like data. I'm like, yeah, I do. He's like, come here. You got to meet somebody else. And he took me upstairs to meet the Oracle DBA. I'm like, Oracle, what's that? And was that I got like, to see uh, like the wizard of Oz? Like, you know, <laughs> <laughs> that's you described that. It's the first thing I popped in my head. It was just one of those, like I stepped in there and I'm like, what is that? And I'm like, Oh, it's more data. I'm like, but I don't like the feel of this for some reason. <laughs> I've always been a Microsoft user at heart. And right. so for me, Oracle, it, it took a while to wrap my head around. So, so I got a question. Early. Was this pre-Toad? Uh, so I don't remember what tool he used because that was, we're talking late 90s. Right, right. So it's about been a that long time, time there was a. There I was do a remember separate, Toad. You remember Toad. Okay, cool. I do remember Toad, but I don't remember if he was using that for his Oracle DBA stuff. I think he was using some kind of fancy Oracle tools at the time. Right, right. Now that's cool. I I have a very similar story where I started doing VB VB three mm-hmm. and and access and kind of like, which was a great platform. A lot of business apps were written with it. Yep. Depending on your point of view, that's a good thing or a bad thing. But what's interesting was access really I think brought the RDBMS to the masses. Yeah, it, it and, became it's approachable for most people. Right. Right. Absolutely. So then, but you were, as I first met you, you were like a C sharp MVP. I'm assuming that was your category. Yeah. Um, uh, at, at that point, I think that's what the category is. Nowadays, it's developer technologies. Right. Right. I was going to ask because I, I, once you join Microsoft, you have to relinquish your MVP status. Yep. So I actually still have the license plate I had made up when I got tablet MVP, which said tablet. Oh, wow. So I, I'm going to hang it right there behind my, uh, my, my matrix monitors. Um, so that, cause that'll be cool. But, um, um, so you, you probably did a lot of, did you get into like ASP.net and stuff like that? And actually, so from there I ended up doing other internships. I did some Fox pro. Wow. I, to say that <laughs> I was a wow. Y2K programmer in Fox pro, no less. Nice. <laughs> so a lot of set century on to get them Y2K compliant. But then I spent the rest of that summer doing payroll and making sure that time clock data was getting passed into the payroll system properly. So again, nice. working with data. And then the following summer, I came home to Cleveland, couldn't find an internship, um, looked in the newspaper and saw there was a, a one of the big companies was hiring a Visual Basic developer who had oh. experience working with Visual Basic and Access because they had a project moving out of Access to SQL Server. I'm like, I know this story. Hold on a minute. That's <laughs> cool. So I, That's cool. I wrote them a letter and said, guys, I'm coming home for the summer. I am a college kid. I am cheap labor compared to that full-time <laughs> position you're probably listing. I'm like, use me to look at that project, maybe get it moving over the summer so it doesn't sit on the back burner. And then if you hire somebody full-time, I can just transition it over to them. I sold myself into a corner office position. It was awesome. <laughs> corner office, no less. That's awesome. And you actually sent a letter. So let me get this straight. Cover letter. You... Wow. For so a for position I watching... saw in a newspaper classified section. So old school. <laughs> yeah, there's going to be like a lot of uh, folks that are, are younger. They're like, 
what's that? So yeah, it turns out kids yeah. used to be this thing called newspapers. I think they're still around. They're still and around. they would they would have classified, so you'd look for jobs in them. They're at the and back of the paper usually. Usually in the back of the paper, right? And sometimes the Sunday section would have like a just an entire whole thing whole of section. it. Section. Yep. And um and then she actually printed up a letter, which is kind of like a text message, but on paper. I, I wrote it in this thing <laughs> called uh, Word Perfect in DOS. <laughs> Oh wow! Now I'm showing my age. God, like, I'm like thinking, like next week. you don't seem that old to me, but but you know. <laughs> no, I turn forty next week. So oh okay, yeah, yeah. I'm I'm older than you, but but still, I'm 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 right there with you. But mm-hmm. um, yeah, I remember cover letters and stuff like that. In fact, my first job in college was I worked in the um, they called it the microcomputer lab, which is basically okay. where everybody had would come to print out stuff. Uh-huh. And it would always be like they, there would always be the special quest. People would come in like with the the heavy paper. Did you do the cotton paper thing? And the, no, the I just did a regular paper. No, okay, okay. But some people would get really into that. But yeah, so that's cool. Yeah. So how did you get into data? Because you know most most developers and mm-hmm. and you can tell me when they hear DBA, they kind of like <laughs> uh, we're like wait wait you- wait I have I have DBA experience too. <laughs> That's right. So you were like one of those people that, that don't bother asking, which is what DBA supposedly stands for. Yeah, don't bother asking. Don't you, leave me alone. Well, so it was one of those. I was a DBA for SQL 6.5 to SQL 2008. Wow. Okay. Um, and, that, and that was one of those that we had a DBA at our manufacturing plant that I was working for at the time. Mm-hmm. Uh, she ended up moving on to greener pastures. I think the ERP system drove her away. She was like, done. And I'm like, okay. I'm like, I got this. And then I noticed that we had SQL servers. And I'm like, I know how to deal with it, with this from a developer perspective. I knew how to deal with it from like working with Crystal Reports and talking right. with Crystal Reports to that. But the management of it all, I'm like, I don't even know where to start. And our DBA just left. So time to jump in on this. <laughs> and so I ended up poking around the system, looking at some of those SQL server stored procedures, because I understood the concepts of it all, but I never really was able to put two and two together. Um, then I found the help docs. And the help docs, even back then, weren't so bad. And so I used that to help guide me as to, okay, profiling sessions, and what is this, and how is this working? Um, so on the DBA side of things, it was kind of interesting to see, like we would have, especially end of year processing, we would have accounting deadlocking with some of the planning tables. And so I had to go back and go, okay, you guys, you guys have to wait. This has to go through first. Uh, did a lot of, of accounting uh, reports. At that point, I actually took a financial accounting class so that I understood the equations for the reports that I was writing. Oh, interesting. So you you've really... You really jumped in. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah. I, I love taking the data and I love being able to build the reports, but I want to make sure that whatever I'm reporting is the right thing. Right. And sure, the accounting folks can give me their equations, but I want to know why. What is this? Right. So. Truly the engineer mind. You're not just happy with <laughs> No. My degree the, is an engineering degree. It yeah. is a blessing and a curse. And a curse. And um, I, Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there, there's a scene in the Dilbert cartoon where they talk about the knack. Did you see that one? Oh God, yeah. Yeah, it's it's so true. It's like, oh no, it's worse than I feared. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. <laughs> Will he live a normal life? No, not really. <laughs> I normal, no. <laughs> if you're confused, look up the YouTube video. It's very funny. Yes. So, so, you, so in 2008, yeah. You did you leave the DBA world or did you stay doing developer stuff? Or were, you, so were you at the I same was, time a DBA and a developer? So I was DBA. Mm-hmm. I was developer because I was we were a four person IT shop. We were oh, wow. a networking guy and and sysadmin and phone banks and desktop guy. Uh, he had all those roles. I was developer and desktop support. Um, ended up becoming developer, de- desktop support, SharePoint admin, web server admin, and phone admin. Interesting. Uh, and then our boss, everyone's got to have a pointy-haired figurehead boss. And then we eventually brought in another developer so that I could push some of those off so I could focus on the DBA role. But it was manufacturing, and it really didn't change much. It was more keep things working, and I mm-hmm. wasn't growing in my skill set. And uh, my husband, so at that point, we had gotten married, and he's just like, yeah, he's like, so he's like, you're unhappy. You're seeing a brick wall. You're just ramming your head in the brick wall. You need to go back into development. 
And so I saw a friend of mine who I worked with at an internet provider years ago. She was working for this company doing some ebooks and audiobook stuff. And they had a developer position open. So I gave her my resume and said, see, there's a web developer position I'm interested in. Can you get me in maybe? And so she gave the resume to her, one of the guys there. And he brought me in for an interview and said, hey, he's like, we've got this web developer position, which I see you've got the skill set for. It's like, but we have this programmer position on the, that does full stack and not just front end. He's like, and it's C sharp. And I'm like, uh-uh, <laughs> not going to do it. Because this is, we're talking, this is before the MVP. Um, right. my, I have a bachelor of science. I was going to say, how could you be a C sharp MVP? But, but yeah, I figured, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no. So I have a bachelor of science in computer science and engineering technology. I had to do C++ for my data structures. I had Java later on had JavaScript in there too, and decided at one point, I hate curly brace languages. They're not VB6. They're not what I know. Right. Um, so and at the manufacturing firm, I made the foolish thought of going, oh, we have some VB6 stuff. I can convert that to VB.net. It's just an upgrade of VB, right? No, it's that object-oriented notation stuff. I can't deal with this. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the guy is like, yeah, he's like, no, he's like, you don't understand. You have C++, you have Java, you will be fine picking up C Sharp. And I'm like, I know, but I don't like curly brace languages. <laughs> That's funny. And so obviously I'm, you got over your curly brace thing. Like, what was that moment where you were like, okay, I, I was just like, like, I need to get out of manufacturing. And my right. friend Laura had been raving about this company. So I'm like, okay, I'll take the opportunity. I guess I'll deal with the curly brace languages. <laughs> <laughs> um, and within two years, within the first two years, I picked up the language and then became an MVP. Well, that's pretty good. I mean, that's, yeah. that's, that's awesome. Yeah. Um, and so now fast forward to kind of more the present day. Yep. Uh, you made a very similar jump I did from kind of the developer world to, well, you, you were in the I, data I, world, then you left, and then now you came back. I'm so kind of was, actually in a split role right now. Really? Okay. Yeah. So my, my title is principal consultant, mm -hmm. but my day is mostly focused on our primary client. So I'm working with React and HTML, okay. CSS, JavaScript for an application for them. But then on top of it, we're for, so that's for our primary client, our, our parent company, but our current, the company I work for stage three, I'm working on their data engineering curriculum. Oh, interesting. So it, it's a combination of working for the parent company to get the bills paid, but also working on our current company to get our product launched. Very cool. Yeah. Very cool. And what is the product? Can you say what that product is? So we offer training. Um, okay. Our our initial goal was to train people who've had at least a few years in the field who want to learn new data sets. Got or it. Not, not data sets, but new skills. And data right. data engineering was one of those skills that we were wanting to focus on. So that's right. one where I've been like, yes, yes, I get to finally put all my data into a course. And I'm excited. That's cool. Well, what's yeah. really cool is that your skills, your time as a developer will help too. Mm -hmm. Well, so I this think is... That's yeah, and I've done coursework uh, development in the past. Right. So I used to do that for a coding boot camp. So dealing with people just getting into the field. And now I'm like, time to move it up a bit. Right, right. Well, there's a, I think there's a large demand because, and I want to get your thought on something that I heard a recruiter say sure. uh, a few months ago. But, I mean, there's a huge demand for this field. And, you know, date, AI, data science kind of gets the, all the headlines mm -hmm. and, and the glamour. But what really, I think, what really makes the world go round is data engineering. Yeah. yeah. And I think that that's going to be the next hotness because everyone can say like, hey, look, I have a model that does X or Y, but like we're, we're dealing with terabytes and yottabytes and zettabytes. And it's like somebody has to make sure that they go from point A to point B. Exactly. So, they have to go from point A to point B. They need to make sure that that data is clean too. Oh, right. clean data is not something that's easy to come by usually. No, people you, putting spaces and field names and oh, I'm glad you mentioned that because have you ever been in the situation? Because this happened to me um, mm -hmm. when I was doing uh, between my Microsoft stints. This happened to me where I said, "Well, you know, talking to the customer or potential customer, saying, well, you know, got to make sure the data is clean," and they stopped me and they said, "No, no, no," and it was more of like a more of a business decision maker who kind of knew technical stuff. Because no, 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 the data is clean. I'm like, okay, <laughs> well, it's fully normalized in that. And I'm like, oh, you just said it wasn't a video call. So they didn't see me cringe. <laughs> and I was like, so I, 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 I kind of trained myself. I didn't get the gig. 
so after that, I kind of trained myself to say shape the data because that's a little yes. less, you know, because uh, I mean, but you're right. I mean, like, you know, and I also think there's also opportunity for for traditional DBA folks to kind of learn how to be data engineers yes, um, or data our, scientists. Yeah. Well, in the, between our DBAs and developers, if mm-hmm. you ever look at, for example, Python and right. creating Python and using pandas to import a CSV and then shape the data. Right. We're using a lot of developer logic there, but we're also using a lot of like reports, writers, and SQL logic in there as well. So right. everybody could do this. And that's what, why I'm excited about this, because you don't need a PhD to be a data engineer. You right. don't need a, a PhD. You don't even, I don't have a master's, right. but I love it and the passion for it. I can show people, this is how you do this. Here's how to understand the concepts. I can break that down. But most we- of all, you've got the skills already. Let me show you how you can use your skills and how they apply. Absolutely. And I think we live in an interesting time because, well, for a lot of reasons. Um, but what really fascinates me is that it used to be you would go to university and get a course and this. But now, mm-hmm. I mean, anyone can learn anything from YouTube. I mean, it's yeah. just like, and it's not just YouTube. I mean, there's Udemy, there's edX. I don't have a master's degree either. I, mm-hmm. uh, I, I, I mean, uh, all my data science certifications, or not all of them, but like 30 of them come from edX, which was mm-hmm. when Microsoft had the joint program with them. And, you know, Same. it's just, it, you, you're right. If you want to learn something, there's not really much stopping you now. And No, um, I mean, my certificates are through Data Camp. Okay. So, yeah, yeah I, mean, I love Data Camp. Of sources. Yeah. They're fun. <laughs> <laughs> so, so here's something I heard a recruiter say. Now, now, if you're a recruiter, I apologize in advance. <laughs> because we are on LinkedIn as well. Uh, there's a weird relationship between technologists mm-hmm. and recruiters, right? Mm-hmm. So you'll hear questions. Well, I, you know, I would get calls for, hey, do you have experience with C-pound? C-hash? Or C-hash. <laughs> I haven't heard that. I haven't heard C-hash in a while, but yeah. Usually C-pound, and I'm like, you mean C-sharp? Yeah, 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 that one. Or another favorite is you get a call on um i think this happened when swift came out somebody posted mm-hmm. this thing uh keep in mind it just came out yep <laughs> do you have 10 years experience with swift <laughs> <laughs> all like, the time all like, the really? time this uh, silver a- oh, sorry go ahead I had a company approach me at a, a SQL user group that they showed me their job rack and they had all these things listed and they had SQL listed spelled out S E Q U E L. Oh, I've seen that too. I've seen that too. And I, I pulled them aside. I'm like, guys, I'm like, just so you know, that's S Q L. We just pronounce it SQL. They're like, oh my, like they were mortified. And I'm like, if you're not a techie, you don't necessarily like, you'll hear us talk these things, but you don't necessarily know what's right. Especially if you have HR or a non-techie write it, that kind of stuff happens. So, so true story. I actually, I actually, this is a you know kind of a lesson in empathy. And empathy is not just this touchy feely thing. It's yep. about learning, seeing the world from somebody else's point of view. Right. That's how I define it. Yep. So, I actually sat next to a recruiter at this consulting company I worked for. Actually, somehow I ended up being the lone tech guy in the cube farm of recruiters, <laughs> which is weird. So one time, I overheard them say how do you spell SQL? Oh no. And I'm like, I got up and I'm like, Hey, just so you know, <laughs> is this for job company, listing guys? Let's talk. I was please. like, <laughs> so I just remember saying it's actually an acronym, like structure. Of yeah. And like, I explained it to them and, and they were actually very grateful because I didn't do it in a condescending way. Cause technologists oh. can be condescending. You mean arrogance and ego? Crazy, right? <laughs> Crazy, right? <laughs> well, I, I, you know, this is not a field known for its people, people. Right. Very true. Right. So I'm not saying that's always true, but I'm just saying. No. I, I'm a people, people. So I understand being right, 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 right. So, so like you get it. And I kind of have this switch where I am and I'm not. So it's like, mm-hmm. that's why I have like a lot of land around my house and stuff like that. So, <laughs> but um, no. So, like, I, I went and explained to them and I kind of taught, also taught them how to fish. I'm like, hey, if you have any doubts, just go to Wikipedia. And this is when Wikipedia was still relatively new. And yeah. like, you know, they definitely kind of up their game in terms of that. So, so if you are a recruiter, you know, and I know a lot of these things come from HR where they say, well, we just want somebody with 10 years experience. You know, you, you know, just, just a little bit of sugar will yeah. make the whole dish taste differently. 
I don't know. That's a weird analogy for someone who eats keto. Um, so, so here's this thing I heard and I was like, I, I was taken aback by it. Cause it, and, and usually rarely am I like, um, I want to get your thought on this. I'm going to look at the cam, the, the video output too, so I can see your reaction. They were looking for a full stack AI developer. Full stack AI developer. Wait a minute. That was okay. my reaction too. Okay. So I'm not, I'm not being like the technology elitist here. Yeah. So, <laughs> so I actually called back the guy cause I, I knew the guy and he's a nice guy. And I called him. I was like, so, so wait a minute, you're looking for a full stack AI developer. Let's unpack that a bit. What, what do you mean? He goes, well, we yeah. want someone who can write uh, the front end code, the back end code, as well as generate the AI models. And I was like, so does that include like doing the ETL? And he knew what ETL was. So probably. Okay. Um, does that include getting the data, sourcing the data, shaping and cleaning it? Oh, yeah. A- a- and they want one person to do this? <laughs> one person. There's always one person. And, and, like, like, yeah. and like how much does it pay? And it was like, it wasn't a stellar salary. Like it wasn't like, you know, I mean, data scientist jobs alone are known for their ridiculous salaries. I'm still looking for that, by the way. So <laughs> I still drive a Honda, as I like to say. Um, hey, I, I have a Dodge Caravan, so I feel you, man. There you go. There you go. <laughs> so, um, so, so no, I, I, I and I kind of unpacked well, it and I was like, AI. so again, I'm trying to do the whole, you know, not be that judgmental techie person, mm-hmm. you know, and I'm like, all right, well, let's unpack this. And I kind of like, how lo- are, have they been successful finding people like this? And he goes, you know, now that you mentioned it, no. <laughs> That's part of the problem, guys. <laughs> <laughs> you- and, and I kind of unpacked it. And I was like, I, I was like, so he goes, what do you think? It was like, are you interested? And I was like, honestly, not. That would be, no, not for that amount of money. And I was like, I don't think you're going to find anyone for that amount of money. And so I was much like, responsibility, yeah. Right. And I was like, let's be real here. I mean, if you, if you look at what J- just AI experts and data scientists make, if they knew that, plus they knew all that other stuff too, let's assume this person does exist. Mm-hmm. They're not gonna. They're not gonna take that kind of money because even if I even if I knew all that stuff, I mean, I'm gonna take a data science job where I don't have to touch. I I think React and Angular are nice technologies, but not for me. <laughs> Right, they are most definitely right. ev- for everyone, but not my not my cup of everyone. tea. In fact, when I was pondering, kind of uh, when I got when I did get rift previously, I was pondering what my next career move was. I remember going to an Angular meetup, and this was like 2016, Ooh. and I just remember just jaw dropping the floor that there were there. It, this was the time. It's not as bad now, but there was like a new JavaScript framework a week. Like mm-hmm. everybody, their cousin and their dog, like came up with the JavaScript framework, and that framework was the hottest thing that week that month yep and i remember when angular switched to typescript and it kind of became like yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. (laughs) so i was at this meetup and and you do community stuff and you know there's usually heated debates in the back of these meetings oh yeah these these two dudes were fighting over like which version of angular (laughs) was better and i'm thinking to myself javascript or typescript javascript or typescript right which is kind of like i like i like cherry diet Memory coke reactions. and you like regular diet coke and let's fight about it it's like it's <laughs> still diet coke dude <laughs> these, are, these are the fights that we see in tech these are the hills that they want to die on and i yeah. just go why which i can understand for outsiders that might put people off because you imagine like it put me off of, it put me off honestly of javascript frameworks in general because i'm like mm-hmm. i could do this or i can learn statistics and calculus again I'm going to go with statistics and calculus. And calculus. At, least, <laughs> at least I know that's awful. I mean, it's not awful. But like, I mean, from my point of view, it was like, and this was my thinking. Again, former Windows phone developer, former Silverlight developer, former Silverlight book author. Yeah. The thing that appealed to me about data science and statistics uh, and calculus is that math is math, right? The rules yeah. of mathematics are the same whether you're running on uh, an Azure data center, Google, or AWS data center. Yeah. The physics are the same too, right? So like for me, that appealed to me because as someone who got really deep in the UWP platform and the mm-hmm. XAML platform, only to find that that once imagined future was an illusion or didn't yep. come to pass, right? whatever that is, I've let it go. <laughs> Despite the facial expression, I've let it go. But like what I would appeal to me was like, you know, linear regression is the same anywhere. Right. You know, and that was kind of, it was, it was inherently cross-platform. So that was kind of my moment for me where I'm like, no, nah, I'm going to go down this path. But, um, you know, I, I, 
to this day, I kind of like every time I have like an idea, I'm like, I should write an app for that. And I'm like, um, crap, I'd what have to learn that. And it's like, and do I really want to do it that badly? No, right, no, right, right. And it's like, it's not that I'm against learning. I mean, I have, I'm at 56 certifications now. So I'm like kind of oh, crazy wow. like that. But like, there's one thing I've learned, particularly as, you know, having kids and stuff like that and dogs, mm -hmm. there's a finite amount of time. Like, time is the resource that matters, right? Yep. So, like, I have X units of time and I need to learn this much. I'm going to go with the data stuff because that's more pressing needs. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of like, you know, one of these days I'm trying to convince my kid to learn unity and stuff like that. So he can, <laughs> in JavaScript, so he can like, here's my idea, <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> which probably makes me a terrible dad, but it is what it is. <laughs> well, say my, li my little guys. So they're six and eight. They're playing with scratch. They're playing with the, Leg the Lego we do, which is a robot tool and their own nice. drag and drop program. And, and I think you're also a two engineer family. Is that correct? We are. My, so nice. I'm on the software side and my husband's on the hardware side. So I live nice. on the most complicated home network ever because this is his playground. <laughs> nice. I need, to, uh, yeah. I, need, I need to pick his brain about some things because I know enough about networking to be dangerous. And my mm -hmm. wife is in cybersecurity. Oh, wow. So, awesome. But she doesn't want to do anything with our network because she, she's right. like, nah, that's work stuff. And then like, I'll build something. I'll set up stuff. And then she'll, she'll be like, you should have done it this way. <laughs> and like we have the same argument like uh, happens about every couple weeks yep. hey how come this isn't blocked you, wait you can do that yeah it's like i'm like well I, and we got new routers like maybe six months ago and mm -hmm. and i'm like i told her i was like can you set this up she goes no i'm like but you could do a better job than me <laughs> exactly and that's what i tell my husband i'm like all the networking stuff I'm like he was just in here earlier today because i have two monitors hooked up to my laptop one mm -hmm. on this side and one on this side mm -hmm. one's hdmi one's USB C, and i figured okay USB C, it can go where my power is and this goes here and he looked at it and he's like this should be fine this should be fine and we realized the USB C on my laptop for the power adapter is strictly power but the docking station plug oh. has, happens to have a USB-C. So now I have my three monitors set up. Nice. As you can yeah. tell, I'm a big fan of multiple monitors. Yeah, I, um, I definitely jumped on that train. But my husband, when it comes to hardware stuff and networking stuff, I'm like, Kev, I need help. And he right. knows like software stuff. So he works for a managed services provider, IT company for small, medium businesses that don't want their own. And he's like, Sarah, he's like, I need to talk to APIs. And I'm like, that's my cup of tea, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> I need to talk to Sophos APIs and ConnectWise APIs. And I'm like, find me documentation and I'm on it. <laughs> that's cool. So we balance so the, each other the, very well. Yeah, that's cool. My my wife will always like, I always like sanity check. Like I'll, I'll mm -hmm. like pull out like a whiteboard or whatever. And all right, this is how I built the network. Is this okay? <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. So I got my um, whiteboard right behind me. <laughs> I'm like, is that okay? And she'd be like, yeah, it looks okay. I was like, did you set this? I'm like, no. No. She's like, oh, come on. And it turns out <laughs> something she wanted, the router did not support. Oh. Because she's used to dealing with like like enterprise level stuff. So it's like, yep. I'm like, well, we can get that. If, I'm like, I'm, I'm game to buy the enterprise router if you're if you're cool with that purchase. And then she looked mm -hmm. it up. She's like, no. <laughs> For that, that price. Important. No. But, yeah. Uh, she's actually studying for a CISSP uh, now, oh, that's... which is Certified Information Security something professional. Yeah. Which is like a big deal. So yeah. Um, so it's cool. So the kids. So this is this is curious. So you have two kids. And I have two kids. So like yep. the kids are like automatically like techies. Like my son was uh, my older son went over to a friend's house and they had a for a play date and like they had trouble with the Wi-Fi network because the play date apparently they were on the iPad playing video games. Of course, that's what kids um, do. It is what it is. Yeah. They like they, he like reset their router, like he like fixed their router issues, and I was like, oh, so proud. You've done well. <laughs> mine aren't at the router yet, but they can tell you how to fix an Xbox, especially if Minecraft's not loading. Hold oh, on, nice. mom. We got to turn it off, unplug it, count to ten, plug it back in, and then we can play. <laughs> nice nice even the six-year-old tells me that and i'm just like okay he's helping at six there is hope for the world <laughs> cool so uh we've been chatting for a while and mm -hmm. uh, i don't know if i can do much more streaming because of work commitments um sure. but i definitely want to have you if you're game um yep. Definitely want to have you back on this live stream because I know you want to show me some cool Jupiter stuff you've been working on. 
yes, because I love Jupiter and I love being able cool. to share what it do you want to show like maybe five minutes of it, not the full shtick, but like a summary version. Um, if you're cool with it, I don't know if we have any comments. We don't have any comments right now, but uh, let me let me show what I've got. Well, I could show Azure notebooks right now, which is cloud hosted cool. Jupiter. All right. Let so, me make sure my browser will let me in there. Azure was, Notebooks is a very cool service. Um, have you played with Azure uh, machine learning services yet? Not yet. I want it's to. It's cool. It's is cool. It? If you like notebooks, Azure Notebook, yeah. you will love AML. Oh, that's I love Jupyter Notebooks. Do you know Brian Sherwin? Yes. Out of Columbus. So he did a mm -hmm. talk at CodeMash many years ago about uh, drops of Jupiter in her hair. So the a play on the train song. But he was showing Jupyter oh, Notebooks yeah. then. And I was just like, oh my gosh, this is so cool, this Jupyter Notebook thing. And at that point, I was working for a client doing some Python training for them. Mm -hmm. And so I ended up incorporating Jupyter into that. So here's the thing. Here's a question. Yeah. When you first saw Jupyter, yep. were, did you get frustrated? Did you get confused? Because the, the one complaint I have about Jupyter, I love Jupyter. But whenever I tell customers or, or I tell people about it, Give it two weeks because you're not not gonna like. You may not like it at first. <laughs> no, it, it, it takes because a because the to state the to. state that your code is actually in memory does not necessarily represented in the notebook. Now, I don't think I explained that right. I suspect you'll do a better job explaining it, but that is confusing for especially for folks used to a full on IDE. Or am okay. I alone in this? Uh, no, know. it has its moments. So I'm going to bring up Jupiter. You okay. should be able to see something I running. See okay, I'm going to close that and close that for now. So the frustrating part about Jupiter, especially if you're running it locally, is understanding what it's looking at here. Mm -hmm. So because I started Jupiter from a Jupiter shortcut on my desktop, it's going to load my default, my C drive. That's very rarely what, where I want to start. That's so, interesting because for me, it seems to do it on my document directory. Well, and it all depends on which you're in. So I'm going to go ahead and bring up the Ana so I have Anaconda installed on here. I want the full thing because I'm like that was my one. next question. Was it like Jupiter? A large Jupiter hard drive, like Anaconda, Anaconda Jupiter. Okay. So I did Anaconda for the installer. I type uh, actually. Let's go into. I want to make their notebooks. See notebooks, and I'll start Jupiter there. So the path that you start Jupyter in when you run it locally makes a difference as to what folder structure you'll see here. I don't want to know how long it took me to get there and going, why can't I go up a folder? That was my main frustration. Interesting. Now, creating a new Jupyter notebook, it was nice. Um, so locally, I've got just Python 3. On another one of my laptops here at home, I have the PowerShell kernel as well. Mm -hmm. And then Azure Notebooks, which is notebooks.azure.com, which I have. Which is an awesome service. It's free. It is free. Um, Let's see. There it is. There you go. So notebooks.azure.com. If I go into any of my uh, projects, so the Nakatas. Oh, no. This is new. Microsoft Azure Notebooks preview website will be retired at the end of September. No. Well, I guess we've discovered news in Azure Notebooks. First mixer, now this. No. Dogs and cats living together. So we discovered this live on LinkedIn, everyone. Live on LinkedIn. That is a first. Is, I have an Azure Notebook talk I do that I have scheduled even into October. So I'm going to have to learn what the results are for where to go next. Well, the good news is you have bit of time <laughs> uh, I, I do i do but i have a, uh, a user group at the end of the month a conference at the other end of the month and still two more user groups after that <laughs> so I we suspect, will see i suspect that there's probably going to be some upgrade path available because there's already a button there that says upgrade your notebook yeah, it says migrate your notebooks if oh I migrate that, not upgrade oh migrate so, so oh microsoft and github this actually makes a lot of sense yeah I'm, and notebooks in Visual Studio it. Code. I've been playing with that, but not comfortable to share yet. There's Azure ML, Azure Lab Services, Visual Studio Code Spaces. So it looks like notebooks are going to a lot more of the products, which is good to see. All right, that makes a lot of sense. So I have, have you played with Jupiter? I know you're you're using Jupiter, regular Jupiter, but have you played with yeah. Jupiter Lab yet? So actually, let me flip back to my Anaconda. Control C. 
Let's kill that process. I don't need you anymore. Uh, I'm going to clear my screen to make it easier to see. Jupiter Lab. And um, if you have, and it sounds like you have, what are your thoughts on Jupiter Lab? Um, I have gotten, so I'm a, a cranky command line kind of person. So I'm used to the gross tree interface. That the, This one, I'm like, this is just so clean. Cranky command line. That's I am a cranky command line person. I will tell you that. Um, but I kind of like it because it makes it easier to see where things are. Right. And it's clear as to where is a new notebook. Or if I want just a console, I can do that. Markdown files, which I use quite a bit. So I have, I do like the lab interface, but for some reason I still go to tree anyhow. I still get that crankiness in me. And I'm like, hey, I just wanted a tree. And it's just a URL switch in reality under the covers. It's still Jupiter. So. Yeah, it's just, it's just, I kind of like where they're going with it, but I haven't warmed up to it. So like I, I, yeah. I have not, I haven't said I, I love it yet, but I haven't quite hated it yet. It's just, it's no, different. It, it's growing on me slowly. So, so what I'll do you think it. about, sorry. Go ahead. What do you think about like the notebook format popping up in SQL Server? Popping up I'm in excited. a lot of places. I am excited to see the notebook in general because for me, I like the interactivity. I me like too. that I can go into a notebook and I always do this stupid, there's a math equation. And then I always do import this. Those are the two ones I show for interactivity to start before going right. into all the the data structures and stuff like that. But I like it because I can show people then too. If um, Azure Notebooks has a feature, which I don't know if the other things will have necessarily, it's the Rise Slideshow extension, right. which uses Reveal.js under the covers for the slides. Um, so I love that feature as well. Because in the presentation I do for user groups, it's an Azure Notebook using Rise so that I'm presenting the slides. And oh yeah, by the way, let's change the markdown in the middle of the presentation. I go ahead and do that right there. And then they're like, That's oh, wait, cool. she's editing her slides in the middle of the talk. And I'm like, by the way, guys, this is an Azure notebook. So then I take them to the file structure and go, look, no tricks up my sleeve. This is how it works. That's cool. It's fun. That is cool. Yeah, I, I, I like the fact that notebooks are popping up in different places. And I, I'm, I'm not sure if I would write C sharp code in a notebook and how that would feel. Like, I know that sounds silly, but like, when I think in C Sharp, I need Visual mm -hmm. Studio, not Visual yes. Studio Code. When I write in Python, I need to have Jupyter. Like I know, I know it's not rational. <laughs> See, for me, it depends on the application. Like mm -hmm. notebooks, I love notebooks for when I'm learning a new language and want to like test little clips out to see how they work, and then making notes about that. I like it in a teaching perspective for also because I usually teach people who are changing into languages. I if, if hoarding languages was a TV show, I would be on that show. <laughs> I pick up languages easily. That's a good, problem to, easily. That's a good yeah. problem to have. So seeing notebooks pop up everywhere, I'm just like, yes, this all has a place. This all can work. SQL, yes, please. That's cool. Yeah, I like I like I like seeing the the format because I think it's something that you needed something more than kind of like the, an interactive shell. Mm -hmm. but less than a full-on IDE. Exactly. exactly. So somewhere yeah. between like a steak knife and a chainsaw, you needed something that would would be like a machete. I don't know. A little sawzaw maybe? Yeah. That'd go in between, I think. Somewhere in the middle, you know? Yeah. I, I, it's, it's, it's exciting. It's it's always a good time to be in, 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 in data and AI and stuff like that. And it's just... It's, so it's many different tools and so much things you can show. It's It's a vast world, that's for sure. Cool. All right. So with that, one last question. Where can sure. folks find out what you're up to and what you're doing? I know your um, Twitter handle is Saduki. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm also on LinkedIn. You're also and on LinkedIn. my LinkedIn URL is linkedin.com slash in slash Saduki. <laughs> if you need Brilliant. to find me anywhere, uh, I'm Saduki just about everywhere. Brilliant. Brilliant. And uh, thanks for joining me on this experiment. Definitely well, want to have you back me. if you're game. Uh, yes. This was a lot of fun. And um, um, yeah. Let's do it so, again. Definitely. Definitely. Well, All right. Well, thank and you for probably having me. You on, the prop, on the podcast too, like as a proper episode. Because I think your story of going to data, then leaving, and then coming back is rather unique. Sure. You know, because most, well, most folks I interact with tend to be developers who've kind of transitioned into data. Um, rarely do they kind of do the, they do the w switch once, rarely mm -hmm. kind of twice like you did. So 
And very Perfect rarely do thing. they cross that line of becoming a DBA. DBAs and developers, that line normally doesn't get crossed. I know. And it's like for the <laughs> longest time, Andy Leonard, who's a mutual yeah. friend and the co-host of my show, tried to convince me to join the data side. And I'm like, eh, I don't want to be a DBA. Like, you don't have to be a DBA to come to data. <laughs> if only I knew that like 10 years ago, I'd be driving a Lambo instead of a, instead of a Honda. <laughs> so that's what I tell my kids because, you know, you know, they're on the hot spot or whatever. And inevitably, you hit a dead spot, right? Like, mm-hmm. Inevitably. And they're like, the internet doesn't work. And we're like, it doesn't work here. It doesn't work everywhere. And then like the, the five-year-old starts screaming. And then, then my older son has heard it so many times. He goes, do you think we'd be riding in a minivan <laughs> <laughs> if we could get the internet to work everywhere? <laughs> Something you like got that. him well trained. I love it. I was like, what? I was like, that's awesome. And my wife just shoots me this dirty look. You know, like it's not all about Lamborghinis. I was like, you're right, dear. It's sometimes it's about Ferraris too. You was gonna say Ferraris. <laughs> my case, I dream of Corvettes. So yeah. Oh, I love, I love that. I used to be a big um, Chevy guy. So. Okay. And I had a, up until about two years ago, I had a '76 Eldorado convertible. Nice. I was just. Oh, such a magnificent joy to drive because even though it was like six tons, it did not feel like you were driving a six-ton car because it had um, it had like a full-on V8 engine in it and stuff like that. So, yes, yes. But I, it needed a lot more repair. So I did in high school. I did some kind of like work in a garage, and it turns out I didn't remember as much as I thought I did. So, <laughs> oops. I was like, you know, and when and the funny thing is, is that it sounds like you're your car aficionado. So like if you have like a carburetor car, there's a lot of kids today that are mechanics have no idea like what to What's do. What's a with carburetor? It. How does this work? Yeah. Right. Like I went to like this the local tires plus or whatever, and it's like a chain. And like I'm like, hey, can you just, you know, take a look at this? And they were like, I'm sorry, I don't know what I'm doing. Like <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> it's just like so for fortunately it turns out um that there was a garage up the road. And this is funny, right? So if you're in the if you're in the classic cars, it's it's an interesting crowd that's in the classic cars. And I mean that in like in a good way. So I don't follow professional football. I'll just put it right out there. I'm right? a Browns fan, so I was gonna say you're you're in Ohio. You kind of have to have a team. <laughs> and I'm sure. a Clevelander, so Browns it there is. There you go. So Turns out this dude's like, you know, next to me in, in at this garage and he has, I mean, beautiful, it was a beautiful 73 Camaro. I mean, red. Oh my God. It was, Gorgeous. it was like, wow. So I'm telling him, is that yours? And I was like, yeah. And he's like, I'm like, wow, that's a really great car. And then he goes, is that yours? And I'm like, yeah, yeah. And it's like, oh, that's cool. Those big like Cadillacs and stuff like that. I'm like, yeah. And then like he leaves and then the owner of the garage is like, do you know who that was? So I was like, no. I was like, I know he's got a really awesome car. That's all I know. He turns out he was one of the Redskins, and I forget the name. So, like, okay. Yeah. I don't know. Just my brush with fame. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much. Thanks for everyone who sure. watched this live on LinkedIn. Thanks for everyone that watched in the, um, uh, in the replay. And um, we'll have Sarah or Saduki back on, on the show sometime soon. Thanks for joining me, and you have a great day.